In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest and peace to God's people on earth. Amen. Amen. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our first reading today is from the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verses 1 through 17, the introduction. After escaping from slavery, the Israelites come to Mount Sinai, where God teaches them how to live in community. The Ten Commandments proclaim that God alone is worthy of worship. Flowing from God, the life of the community <coughs> flourishes when based on honesty, trust, fidelity, and respect for life, family, and property. The word. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and to the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock or alien resident in your towns. For in the six days, the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea, and all that is in them, but rested the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and your mother, so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Our psalm today is Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the sky proclaims its maker's handiwork. One day tells its tale to another and one night imparts knowledge to another. Although they have no words or language, their voices are not heard. Their sound has gone out into all lands and their message to the ends of the world, where God has pitched a tent for the sun. It comes forth like a bridegroom out of his chamber. It rejoices like a champion to run its course. It goes forth from the uttermost edges, edge of the heavens and runs to the end of it again. Nothing is hidden from its burning heat. The teaching of the Lord is perfect and revives the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure and gives wisdom to the simple. The statutes of the Lord are just and rejoice the heart. The commandment of the Lord is clear and gives light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean and endures forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteousness altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, more than much fine gold, 
sweeter far than honey, than honey in the comb. By them also is your servant enlightened, and in keeping them there is great reward. Who can detect one's own offenses? Cleanse me from my secret faults. Above all, keep your servant from presumptuous sins. Let them not to get dominion over me. Then shall I be whole and sound and innocent of a great offense. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Our second reading is from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 18 through 25. The introduction. The word of the cross is pure foolishness and nonsense to the world because it claims that God is mostly revealed in weakness, humiliation, and death. But through such divine foolishness and weakness, God is working to save us. The center of Paul's preaching is Christ crucified. The word. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning will I forth. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demanded signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called both Jews and Gentiles, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom, and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Here and ends the reading. Let your steadfast love come to us, O Lord. Lord. Save, Save us, us as, as you, you promised. Promise. We, we will trust your, your word. word. The gospel today is from the book of John. Chapter 2, verses 13 through 22. The introduction. Jesus attacks the commercialization of religion by driving... Come out it! Out I just bought those birds! Challenge Come to out! Mysteriously What's he doing? ...prediction of his own Come death out! and resurrection. In the midst of a seemingly stable, My rebellious gosh, what's center, going on? Jesus suggests that the center itself I has just come to be purified! The Passover of the Jews That's was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the here. temple, he found people I'm selling up. cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers yeah, seated at their tables. Making a whip of my cord, animals. he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling oh. the doves, take these things oh. out of here. Stop making my father's Lambs house a marketplace. Street. His disciples Lambs, remembered that in the street. zeal for your house oh. will consume me. And the Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for what doing this? Doing? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, this temple has been under construction for 46 years and will you raise it up in three days? But he, after he raised them, his disciples remembered that he had said this. And he said to them in the word that Jesus had spoken. too much longer, but I was here alone, and sometimes I love to come to the synagogue to do the prayer list, to pray for people right the synagogue, the church, right here at the altar. As I was coming up the hallway, um, I see the, the switch, which I always do, to get me into that room, and it wouldn't switch. And the switch is stuck. It's stuck. And so I'm 
put it with all my might have pushed it up and then I went over to look and it's the fire alarm. It says in an emergency pull the switch. Thank God. Once again, I screamed. I almost screamed. I'm like, oh my God. But it didn't catch it. So thank goodness I was flicking up instead of pulling down. But that would have been something else again. So, you know, it's interesting because now we're at a time when Christ is going for the Passover, just like we are getting ourselves ready for Easter, to get purified for the Passover, Christ goes to Jerusalem. And there, you make sacrifices, you, you do everything to repent, to wash, to get yourself ready for the sacred dinner, the Passover. So Christ walks over to the synagogue, he goes into the inner circle where scholars debate. That's where scholars will read the scripture and debate on the scripture and people will pray. And instead of seeing that, he sees the North Point flea market. He's, it, think about that flea market. It's so much fun, isn't it? You walk it, lots of noise. Loads of noise. Picture yourself at any flea market, inside and outside in nice weather. People shouting, bargaining. Oh, I'll give you so and you know, 10 for that. I won't go one more dollar further. People calling, hey Joe, I haven't seen you for a while. I like the animal section of North Point because you do hear animal noises, birds, chinchillas will bark in there, you know, ducks are quacking like crazy. That is exactly what Jesus came upon. And yeah, people were exchanging money. Yeah, here's your change. Don't forget you have to pay the tax. They had to pay the temple tax. And Christ just, he couldn't. He just couldn't see the house of his father so profaned. We are going through the Bible, as you know, in a year. And we're at the part of Leviticus. That house of God was so holy in those days, it wasn't a synagogue yet. It was the tent of meeting. And in the tent of meeting, that the Ark of the Covenant resided. And that was only to be touched and administered to by the high priest. So there were four poles. And people carried this holiest of holy. Um, it's an actual ark or like a, a little temple, little tiny one. On those poles, inside was the Ten Commandments. The actual Ten Commandments. So the, the um, priests, lower priests, would carry the pole wherever they went. They set up in the wilderness in a new spot. And sure enough, one of the priests in the front stumbled. And the ark got unsteady. The priest in the back reached to make it right and was struck dead. Because you do not touch the Holy of Holies. If you brought a blemished altar, a blemished animal to that altar for a sacrifice, you were cut off from your people. That's how serious it was. It had to be the perfect, perfect animal. Only the greatest of, of the prophets like Moses could go into the Holy of Holies. And then Aaron could go in the second layer. That's how revered the temple or the place of God was. In the beginning, by God's own orders, now in the New Testament, we have these people who are making a mockery of it. A total mockery of a holy, sacred place where God resides to be with you and me. And the Israelites, the Jews that surrounded. Now, here's the thing. Imagine if one day, right, um, we get taken over here at St. John's by a group that says, we want to worship too. We want to get in there. But it's just you know, the same kind of thing. They're selling animals for sacrifice. Litter of hay and just gunk and animal bird droppings because there were birds in that place of selling too. You could get two turtle dogs. Bird droppings just everywhere on the rafters. People screaming no! as they're swooping, right? And then some guys are like, ah, we'll get rid of them. And they throw a bag of stones they collected from our parking lot and they strike one of the stained glass windows, shards of glass on the floor. Carpets are being stained by some of the animals. 
Um, and then you come up to the altar and there's our beautiful purple paramounts. But somebody's like, oh, we got to get rid of this animal gunk. Grab one of those cloths and we'll clean off the pew. That's exactly how Jesus felt when he saw his synagogue, God's synagogue. Can you imagine how you would feel seeing St. John's like desecrated like that? Righteous, holy anger would be in you just the way it was in Jesus. And from Psalm 169, it says, the zeal of the temple, the church, the synagogue is in him. And I know it's in us. You don't spend like a whole weekend sanitizing and, and cleaning and putting ribbons on pews and, and decorating the trees and putting up the candles that, you know, you have to nail in the, the pew candles and you do all this and you decorate for Lent and just to see people come in and, and make a mockery of it. There's no way we would let that happen. We love St. John's. This is our home. This is also God's home. And so Jesus was, no. And he literally made whips and drove out the animals, uh, overturned the tables of the money changers. He just said, no, get out of here. My father's house is a house of prayer, not a den of thieves, charging, you know, twice what a turtle dove would cost. So you can make your sacrifice and be purified before God. Does this surprise any of you? Now, we know that Jesus is perfect, and the holy anger he felt would be the same as our anger we would feel if somebody did this to our beloved sanctuary. But does this surprise you, considering how much of a pacifist Christ always was? For instance, he said, if somebody strikes you in the right cheek, turn the left cheek. If they take your cape, give them your coat too. Don't fight back forgive. Do you know Christ was a model for Gandhi? And if you ever saw films of what Gandhi and his many, many um, wonderful Indian protesters did to get freedom from the British, they walked up to a line of British soldiers and the British soldiers would beat them in the head with their guns and kick them. And that person would crawl off and another person would come. It got so bad that the British soldiers not only started feeling a little guilty, but also their arms were tired of beating Indian protesters down to the ground as they just walked off in peace. They let their will be known, but they never struck a soul. That was Jesus's model for Gandhi. And that's what he took, the pacifist model. Then we have Martin Luther King Jr who also followed Christ. You know, he was a reverend, very strong faith. And then he also loved the way Gandhi did it. Do you know that to be trained for one of his marches, you had to be put into a room and his leaders would kick you, you know, kick you, push you around, call you every negative, disgusting slur in the whole wide world that you could think of calling you names because you're a woman and you're black and just awful things. Then they would, would literally um, threaten you, shove you around. And I had a um, wonderful author named Jacqueline Goodson come to our school when I was teaching there. And her aunt went through that training and made it all the way to the end to do the big march in Selma, made it all the way to the end. And then one of the, um, the leaders, spit on her. And she just started beating him senseless. And uh, Martin Luther King said, maybe another time, another place for you. And he asked her to leave. Yeah, that's how important pacifism was to both Dr. King and Gandhi as example by Jesus. So why does Jesus get all violent and, and angry? Because of the zeal of the house of the Lord it's holy, righteous anger. It's the kind of anger that says, my God deserves a sacred place where we meet with God. And that's exactly why he was so angry. Now, he's facing his crucifixion very soon, which is why he says, of course, the leaders love to torment him. And uh, he said, you know what? Destroy this temple and I will build it back in three days. Well, that synagogue that they were worshiping in was, was Herod's 
building, Solomon's great temple was already destroyed. Jesus prophesied that that temple would not be left brick on brick, and it wasn't. By the time John was written, that temple had already been destroyed. After all those years, building it precisely for God. And literally, like, just the, the man that laid the cornerstone knew full well that probably his grandchild, if not his great-grandchild, would finish it up. That's how intricate, that's how long it took to build it. And Jesus says, I'll raise it up in three days. They're like... <laughs> And then, of course, it's explained he meant the temple of his body. He meant the temple of his body. So here's another thing for us to ponder. We love the house of the Lord. We love it. But where really does God reside? What if, God forbid, um, just like it happened in Dundalk, all those three churches that are now called New Life, um, they, they couldn't support their building. And so they all three lost their buildings and they decided to come together and build a new building. But there was one church, St. Luke's, right there on Dundalk Avenue, who said, we won't leave our building. We don't care. And they're tiny, but they're hanging in, right? They're hanging in by the skin of their teeth. But if we don't have a building, which they didn't have their synagogue after it was ruined in the Roman resurrection, the Roman um, resurrection, um, what in fact do we have left? We have the temple of our bodies. We have Christ, because Christ even said, destroy this. I will raise it up in three days. And he meant his body. Our bodies are temples of God filled with love and strength and courage and peace and joy because of the Holy Spirit that dwells in them, in us. So God's got us no matter what. Whether we have a beautiful place to worship in, which this is truly a beautiful place. Uh, Joyce and I walked in during the day and it was kind of dark and the sunshine was brilliant through the windows and it was just beautiful in every way. And it is beautiful because we keep it that way for God. But we also have our temples of our bodies, which we keep pure and good for God's sake. We're trying not to, you know, hurt them health-wise or, or do destructive things to them um, through overeating or smoking or drugs or whatever it is um, that we tend to do. We want our temples just as beautiful as that synagogue was, so that God resides in us. So here's the thing, we never are without God. It doesn't matter. We have a wonderful building that God is blessing. We have each other who God is blessing, but we have Christ inside the temple of our bodies, and that's all we really need to live an abundant, happy life. In Jesus' name, amen. God, my faithful God, true fountain ever flowing, without whom nothing is, all perfect gifts be stowing. Give me a healthy frame, and may I have within a conscience free from blame, a soul for stain with me. Give me the strength to do with ready heart and willing whatever you command by calling here fulfilling to do it when I ought and all my might and bless whatever I have wrought you for me. Keep me 
from saying words that later need recalling. Guard me lest idle speech may from my lips be falling. But when within my place I must and ought to speak, then to my words give grace, lest I offend the weak. When danger gathers round, oh, keep my calm and fearless. Help me to bear the cross when life and safety fearless. Help me when I have taught to love both great and small, and by your Spirit's might live at peace with all. Lenten Louie decided he definitely wants to be at the pulpit, so I said, whatever. Um, you know, Jesus was preparing for the Passover, and we are preparing through Lent for Holy Week. That's correct. And that's why I'm Lent and Louie. I want to tell you all about Lent. That's correct. And what are you going to talk about today? Get up fasting for Lent. I want the children to tell me what they're giving up for Lent. Well, I have it in good authority. A few of them said they're giving up, like talking badly about their friends or giving up candy because they ate way too much of it and they didn't feel well after eating it. And they knew that was a bad thing to do for their bodies. Awesome, really awesome. Yeah, they're pretty awesome kids in this church. I'll tell you that right now. They're all getting ready now to prepare an Easter play that we'll see during Easter Sunday. And also, we're going to tape them marching, you know, with beautiful parts of nature. Hopefully, their families will tape, take them marching with branches and flowers and all kinds of stuff. So we can show that for Palm Sunday, too. I don't want to talk about that. Why? Because it means lunch over. Oh, it's true. Lent is over as of, yeah, that Friday. That Friday before Holy Week. Listen, you'll be fine in my closet. You lived there for a long time and you loved it. That closet has everything you could need. Oh, tell me about that. Oh, what a mess. But you know, seriously, it has crafts, keep you busy. I need food. I threw out that 10 year old candy. I had to, you shouldn't eat that anyway. I want the children to keep going with Lent. I want them to always pray. That's a good idea. Like, you don't stop after Lent. If the children decided they wanted to pray extra for Lent and ask Jesus to come into their hearts and keep them closer and closer to God no matter what, that's a beautiful prayer. Every single day of Lent, why should they stop when Lent's over? They should not stop. They should think of me and not stop. I will be alone in a closet. Hun, listen to me. There's a possibility we could rename you Sunny Sam, and you could come out for vacation Bible school and, and such. Summer Sam. I like Summer better. Okay, Summer Sam. That's who you'll be. Thank you. You're welcome, sweet pea. All right. Now, the peace of the Lord be with you all. Share the peace. Peace everyone. Peace, everyone. Peace, everybody. Bless you all. Peace. Peace, everybody. <laughs> Peace and love, everybody. Yes. Peace. Peace, everybody. During Lent, we say the Nicene Creed. Thanks to the Council of Nicaea, we were given this creed as a treasure and a gift. And during this time, the Christianity that existed then, that was persecuted, became legal and was made the number one religion in the Roman kingdom.
So that is, we are honoring that Council of Nicaea by saying the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, the maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. Believe in Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, as incarnate of the Holy Spirit, from Virgin Mary, came human. For death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. He is worshipped and glorified. Relying on the promises of God, we prayed boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. There is no God before you. Purify the faith of St. John's, that your people place their trust in nothing beside you. Your name is holy. Guide your church that in every situation, your people's words and actions honor your name. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. Heavens declare your glory, renew your creation, provide the leaders here at St. John's with the help they need in the struggle for clean air and water, protect creatures and crops that rely on healthy ecosystems, give all people the willingness to repent when our way of life pollutes the earth and skies. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. Your foolishness is wiser than human wisdom. Fill St. John's leaders with the foolishness of your peace <clears throat> and mercy. You defend the vulnerable. Be with our church council, the committee chairs of Friends for Supper, parish hall renters, rentals, the toy drive, the technology committee, our financial funds, and our food pantry as we administer just and fair outreach to the most vulnerable in your creation and to the glory of your name. Hear us, O oh God. Your mercy is great. Your weakness is stronger than human strength. Protect those who are vulnerable and give courage to all who are suffering, especially those we name in our hearts and those on our parish prayer list. Arlene, Mel, Kenny, Heather, B, Bill, Brian, Bob, Kobe, Cora, the Howe family, Jamie, Jen, Joanne, Kathy, Katie, Bucky, Yvonne and John, Marina, Matt, Michael, Molly, Pastor Walter, Phyllis, Roy, Scarlett, Skip, William, Joyce, Natalie, Tina, Debbie, Mary, Bert, Sandy, Martin, Roy and Phyllis, Bert and Charlotte, Sherry, Darlene, Wendell, Jocelyn, Alan, Linda, and those serving in our military, Andrew, Austin, James, Joseph, Marshall, Sean, Troy, Vincent, and Alex. Yeah. Defend the victims of crime and bring redemption to those who have harmed others. Give the Sabbath rest to all who labor. Hear us, O God. 
your mercy is great. You proclaim, you call to us to proclaim Christ crucified. Give clarity to this congregation and our leaders so that we might follow Christ beyond our own habits and comfort. Clear out anything in our common life that it would obscure the gospel or that serves our own interests. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. The cross of Christ is your power for all who are being saved. Thank you for the perpetual felicity and all the martyrs whose witness reveals the power of the cross. Give us the same trust in life and in death. Hear us, O God, your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lift them to the Lord. We forgot the offertory prayer. I'm going to go back. For our offertory prayer today, let us pray together. God of wonder, you formed, you formed us, us in our mother's, in our mother's womb, womb, and from and Mother from Earth, Earth you bring forth this bread and, bread and wine. wine. We place we them place on them your on table, table together, together with our, our lives and all, and all that you have made. made. Open the heavens to us and pour out your spirit. We wait for your mercy. We long for your peace. We hunger and thirst for Jesus Christ, our banquet of life. Amen. Amen. These glasses from someone. <laughs> the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and at all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so with the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, 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 holy. Lord God of power and might, Heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. In the night in which our Lord and Savior was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to all that were with him. And he said, take and eat for this bread is my body broken for you. Do this as many times as you eat it in the remembrance of me. After the supper also, he took the cup, the cup of wine, and he poured it and he gave thanks for it. And he gave it to all his disciples to drink it. And he said, drink, for this is my blood given for you. And as often as you drink this, do it in the remembrance of me. O oh God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit onto us and also onto these gifts of bread and cup. Bless this feast and grace our table with your presence. Come, Holy Spirit. We know that Christ has died, Christ is risen, and Christ will come again for us to take us into the new heaven and the new earth. We ask you now to reveal yourself to us in the breaking of this bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for this world. Breathe new life into us and send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. 
with all of our beloved ones who have gone before us, your holy ones, God, of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O oh God, blessed and holy Trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen and preserve you and keep you in grace and peace and joy forever and ever. Those on Facebook and Zoom may take the cup and the wafer as it has been blessed. And now everyone is invited to this feast. As long as you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, no matter how old you are, or no matter what you think you've done to not deserve the love of Christ and communion, you are wrong. God loves you so much.
Ya. <laughs> and now let us pray together. Faithful God, you have kept your promise to us in this meal, nourishing us with the gift of salvation. Now send your servants forth in peace that we may testify to your goodness and share the hope that is ours in Jesus Christ, Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Now may Christ, the wisdom and power of God and the source of our life together, keep you united in mind and purpose. And the blessing of Almighty God, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit be with you always. Amen. Amen. May we stir up our hearts with God's mission for us in the world.